tēnā koutou katoa. Haere mai, welcome. Greetings to you all and welcome to our service this morning on this first Sunday in the season of spring. It's also a special welcome to all of the dads today because today is a celebration of Father's Day. Uh, I just uh, might want to forewarn you that there will be a surge of people arriving shortly who will uh, be leaving the uh, meeting that's been held, the briefing for the garage sale, which is taking place up in the hall. That's why some of our pews are looking a little bit empty at the moment. There's a briefing taking place. However, we will get our service underway and they will join us momentarily. As a people of God, we are reminded that as followers of Christ, we are his disciples, called to carry our cross with commitment and faith. We are to choose life, a life loving and obeying God, with our hearts open and our eyes open. That is the theme for today, eyes wide open, which Reverend Louise will enlighten us in her sermon. And today, Mark is our liturgist. So as we commence our time of worship, let me open us with prayer. Lord God Almighty, we praise and worship your holy name. We thank you for your grace and mercy. Your presence brings us strength, peace, and hope in our lives. Empower us to do great things today and every day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And so let us be upstanding for our opening hymn. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Let us be upstanding. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's obviously Father's Day today, but not in the UK, which confused my father a little bit when I sent him a happy Father's Day this morning. So there we go. Grace and peace to you from God. God fill you with truth and joy. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, 
cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the teaching of Christ. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Spirit of God, search our hearts. Hear God's word to all who turn to Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every kind of wrong. Jesus said, there is joy among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God has promised forgiveness to all who truly repent, turn to Christ in faith and are themselves forgiving. In silence, we call to mind our sins. Let us confess our sins. Merciful God, we have sinned in what we have thought and said, in the wrong we have done, and in the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance. We have sinned in weakness. We have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us for our Saviour Christ's sake and renew our lives to the glory of your name. Amen. I rungi te mana o ihu karaiti, ka murua e te atua o koutou hara, ka weta kina ngā meka meka e here nei i a koutou, ka unuhia ngā mā wiwitanga e pehi nei i a koutou. E me ana te karaiti, haere mai haere i runga i te rangi mārie. Through the cross of Christ, God has put away your sin. God have mercy on you, pardon you, and has set you free. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. God strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Now, I may have missed the kids going out for church, so I apologize to the kids who had to stay in a little extra longer than normal. So let us pray for the, for the kids and for the youth. Father, as the youth and kids leave us for their own time with you, help us to remember that they hold particularly special place in your heart. That while right now we may be parents, guardians, and friends, tomorrow they are our leaders, our doctors, our carers. Help us to support them and support them in their work, walk with you. Amen. So the sentence for today, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower doesn't first sit down and estimate the cost? And the prayer for today, 
God of gentleness, you gave up all be with us. Enable us to love, obey, and hold fast to you alone, so that we may complete what we have started. One Lord, now and forever. Amen. Would the readers like to come up? A reading from Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning at verse 15. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. second reading is from um, the book of Philemon, um, starting at verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Achippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith towards the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty. Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed Youthful, useful both to you and me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I want to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent, in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but now much more to you, because in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. 
If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about you owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident in your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Gospel reading is taken from Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 25. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the term of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the gospel of Christ. Would you like to be seated? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, God. Amen. I have noticed recently many people in our city are counting the cost. A cycleway over the Harbour Bridge, light rail out to the airport, relocating the port of Auckland out of the downtown city, central city, a new stadium. Lots of big projects have been touted by city councillors, but some have been very carefully just placed to one side. Mayoral candidates are choosing carefully what they're proposing as campaign agendas. They are all very carefully counting the cost, as backing the wrong one might not get them across the line when it comes for voting for the most preferred mayoral candidate. The government, too, is counting the cost of pledges such as the one to do with Kiwi Build and social housing. But before this gets into a political debate, let's turn to our gospel passage. And we have Jesus offering some important advice and also a warning. He too is supporting the need to count the cost or to enter into something 
with our eyes wide open. Today's Gospel reading from Luke is one of those ones that is disturbing. The worst thing about it is that it's relatively simple. If there's a real complex theological conundrum embedded in it, we could spend time working out what the original Greek meant and how that applied to Jesus' culture and how that might extrapolate into ours. But actually, it's not that hard. Jesus' example about building and going to war seems easy enough to understand. Our Defence Force and the government carefully considers the risks and the political implications before sending our troops overseas to get involved in conflict. You know, the various permutations are carefully calculated out because there is a lot at stake. If you're considering building a new house or perhaps putting a, a new renovation onto your existing one, or dare I say doing a church building project, once the plans are finalised, then all the costs are carefully calculated and considered before the project begins, just as Jesus says. So why is Jesus throwing these warnings out now? Well, in the earlier chapters of Luke, we have seen Jesus perform some spectacular feats. And when I use that word, I'm not trying to make him sound out like he belongs in the circus. In Nan, a large crowd saw Jesus raise a widow's only son, causing him to sit up and speak. He healed a man with leprosy. He healed a withered hand. And he has been helping the fishermen catch so many fish in their boat that the boat is almost in risk of sinking. I'm guessing there was going to be quite a following of Jesus. They hadn't seen things like this before. And there would have been excitement around the crowd when they gathered. This Jesus, he's really something. Things are happening. Sure, there would have been the hecklers, and there would, of course, have been the authorities trying to catch out Jesus, and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Now, Jesus, however, isn't saying, come and follow me, this is going to be amazing. He's virtually saying the opposite. You need to know what you're going to get into here. Do you realize that this is going to be tough? And he draws on that comparison of the builder setting out to build a tower, explaining that surely they would sit down and work out if they had enough money before they put that first foundation stone down. How many other people get onto the computer and start Googling something and end up going down a rabbit warren and you end up looking at all sorts of things you weren't quite intending to and you spend hours on looking at something and there was a few at the 8 o'clock nodded with me. I'm glad I wasn't the only one. I thought, I'll put some pictures up for our 9.30 service. I'll look up unfinished buildings short of money. And there was a whole lot. You know, the, the 10 most you know, unfinished buildings around the world, and you start reading all about them, and yeah, time went on. And I thought, this is silly. You guys can also look up unfinished buildings. You might know of follies that you have gone to visit that have either half been done because a person ran out of money. And if you've ever watched the Grand Design Program on TV, I must admit, I like those sort of programs you often and occasionally get to the very end of the program and instead of seeing a couple or a family nicely in the house and everything looking fantastic, when, when the person who fronts the program goes back, sometimes they have come back to a still unfinished building. The costs have skyrocketed and they're unable to finish. And sadly, in some cases, perhaps sadder, sometimes it might be finished, but they're told that the house is going to need to go on to market to be sold to cover the costs of building this folly, this grand design that costs a lot more than they thought of when they first started. But Jesus is in the Bible isn't trying to advise potential builders or even army leaders. This, of course, relates to the cost of following Jesus. Wouldn't it be foolish to set out to follow Jesus without knowing the full cost? In essence, Jesus himself is saying, please don't. 
Remember the stories where he tells wannabe followers to bury their dead first and give away all their possessions? I wonder if some of us sometimes need to be sent away to go and sort out our priorities before we come back as true followers of Jesus. Those followers that Jesus was talking to, of course, they were going to, at times, putting their life on the line. Sometimes this was going to be the difference between life and death. There was a lot at risk. There was a lot they were signing up to when they chose to follow Jesus. As I was reading through material, there is sort of that comparison that comes from a lecturer who explained that you know, in the university, you can have people who come and sit in more seats and will attend lectures. But that actually doesn't make them a student. A student is someone who attends the lectures and goes and applies that knowledge and works it out and does the extra study and, and it makes a difference in their life and their knowledge and their understanding. Sometimes we can be in danger of just attending the lectures. Now, we might argue that if we came to faith as a child, almost inheriting our faith, perhaps there was never a point at which you stopped to consider the cost. A bit like the days when children used to be able to be added onto their parents' passports, way back in, I think it was about 1992, you could just add them on, and there came a time when that young person had to get a passport of their own. When it comes to our faith, it might be a little bit like if a child is baptised as, as an infant. So the parent takes all those responsibilities on. The parent brings them along to church to Sunday school. They don't, they don't get here on their own. And as they get to teenagers, and particularly teenagers who can drive and make their own choices, some will choose to sleep in rather than coming on um, to church on a Sunday. You might know yourself as your children that you carried and got to church all the way through to about 16, 17 when they left home. Maybe they don't come to church anymore. And that was a decision that they have made. At some point, we all have to choose to become and decide whether we want to become citizens of God's kingdom, accepting all the benefits, but also expecting, accepting responsibility for the costs involved. Kerry, this works this week starts the conversations around confirmation with a group and they'll meet for four Wednesdays as they find out a bit more about their faith but also know quite fully what they're getting into before they come to that part of the service in October when they undertake the confirmation for by the bishop. Today's gospel reading is a bit like the fine print in a contract. You need to read it carefully before you sign up. Now, Jesus certainly cannot be accused of using a soft sell approach when he comes to calling us to discipleship. You know, while salesmen, salespeople are told to extol the good points and just ignore the bad ones, wait until you have your customer hooked before you tell them the price. Jesus comes out with a price up front, and it's steep. The cost? Everything. Family? Friends? comfort, and even our own lives are to be offered up for this chance to follow Jesus. Jesus not only gives the example of calculating the cost of building and the cost of going to war, he also speaks of relationships. And if you have to choose, if the values of the kingdom and of your own family are at odds to each other, will you put Jesus first? That is an interesting reading to have on Father's Day, isn't it? When it says to implies that you need to hate your father and mother. Really, Jesus? On Father's Day? That's the one that the lectionary you put down for us to have? It's not quite, I don't think, quite that black and white. But it is clear in terms of priorities. Jesus warns the potential cost in relational terms. If the relationship with your immediate family, mother, father, brothers, sisters, is preventing you from following him, then the ultimate price is the one where you turn your back on your family. He doesn't want us to hate our families, but he does want us to be unswerving in our commitment. In terms of comparison, we are to have a higher love of God 
than anyone else and anything else. Talks about giving up possessions and there's no room for compromise. Not just materialism, but giving up our own right to own self-determination. You might know in the Bible that parable, that metaphor about God being a potter and us being the clay. So it's a bit like a lump of clay, thinking it has the right to tell the potter how it would like to be shaped. We can often forget that we are the clay in the potter's hands, and it is our role to surrender to the potter. Because God does know what is best for us. God knows how to shape us gently and grow us into who God wants us to be. And that can be far greater than anything we could possibly imagine. Is our first priority God? And then everything else follows after that. Perhaps only you can answer that. But the question is, are we prepared for the cost of following Jesus and whatever that looks like. Let me offer a prayer. God, you know that we are stubborn people and we like to do things our own way. And this scripture is pretty hard hitting. There is a cost for following you. It might not be putting our lives on the line like those disciples did as Jesus spoke to them. But there still is sometimes a cost for us in 2022. Help us to obey your call, knowing that you are the potter and we are the clay. And if we allow you to, then you will mold us and shape us into the best person that we could possibly be. Give us courage to accept your call and the willingness to follow your lead. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us stand for the creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified and has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please sit or kneel for the prayers. Lord, you have promised to hear us when we pray. So in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, please Hear us now. Lord, we pray for your church. We pray for all of your church, but especially we pray for your church and people in areas of conflict, danger, and persecution. 
we pray for your church as he spreads your message of peace, tolerance and love. Please give us the courage and hope to persevere, to bring comfort and care to those in need. In particular, we pray for the churches in China, in Myanmar, in Russia, and all places where faith is under attack. God of grace, you hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the world. We pray because the divisions between us seem to be growing ever wider with little focus on what draws us together. We see people and countries compete for resources, for power, for position and money. And this seems to be becoming more and more important. We pray that the spirit of competition gives way to the spirit of mercy, of sharing and of compassion. We pray for all countries that are divided, that are in conflict, or that are in strife. We particularly pray for Ukraine and for Russia, for China and the US. We pray for Taiwan and Hong Kong. And we pray for Ethiopia and Eritrea. God of grace, you hear our prayer. Lord, we are so lucky to live in this peaceful, well-resourced part of the world. And Lord, we are very grateful for that. Please help us to see how fortunate we are and to see those that are the have-nots, those that are struggling, and those to whom we need to reach out a helping hand. Please bless your church in New Zealand, and in particular we ask for your guiding hand on Kerry, on Ross and Louise. Please help them to lead us wisely and for us to support and lift them up. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for those that are sick and hurting. We ask for your healing and for the drive to grow in us to live what we proclaim to be active, compassionate Christians that we all want to be. Help us to lift up the sick and the poor, to spend our time and money with them, demonstrating in acts the love and faith that you have called us to. God of grace, Hear our prayer. We pray for those who have left us to join the cloud of witnesses that look on, urging us forward, urging us to hold true to you. Lord, we mourn our loss, but celebrate their gain. Please comfort all of those who feel that searing pain of loss. Help us to walk alongside them, to comfort and love, so they feel the love of Christ. God of grace, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to bring these to you in prayer. We ask that you help us to bring our prayers into action so that we, at the end of the day, are welcomed home as you good and faithful 
disciple. Amen. I invite us all to stand for a sharing of the peace. Blessed be Christ, the Prince of Peace, who breaks down the walls that divide. The peace of God be always with you. Praise the Christ who unites us in peace. And so let us share words and a sign of the peace with each other and those around us. The Lord's peace. And as Antoinette makes her way to the organ, I invite you to very shortly sing our offertory hymn, O Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end. Lord, be forever near me, my master and my friend. Blessed are you, God, of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts of food for the city mission, offertory, and bread and wine to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. The Lord is here, God's Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to offer thanks and praise. It is right indeed, ever-living God, to give you thanks and praise through Christ, your only Son. You are the source of all life and goodness. Through your eternal word, you have created all things from the beginning. When we sinned and turned away, you called us back to yourself. 
and gave your son to share our human nature. He made the one perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world. In him you have made us a holy people by sending upon us your holy and life-giving spirit. Therefore, with the faithful who rest in him, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory and thanksgiving to you, Holy Father. On the night before he died, your son Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup. When he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my body of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Therefore, loving God, recalling your great goodness to us in Christ, his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and this cup of salvation. With thanksgiving and hope, we say, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Your death we show forth. Your resurrection we proclaim. Your coming we await. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And as Christ teaches us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ's body was broken for us on the cross. Christ is the bread of life. His blood was shed for our forgiveness. Christ is risen from the dead. Come, God's people, come to receive Christ's heavenly food. You might like to be seated as our uh, servers come forward. And just a reminder that there's sanitizer at each station, and there is the chalice and the individual serving of grape juice. Please come forward when you are ready.
our prayer after communion. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. The hope you have set before us so we and all your children shall be free. And the whole earth live to praise your name. Amen. And so as we depart from here today, may our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to take up our cross, be with you and defend you, within you to keep you, before you to lead you, beside you to guard you. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you forever. Amen. Have we got any notices or celebrations? No birthdays, anniversaries, someone waving down the back. Is it, is it, oh, Ethan, Ethan's got a birthday. Ah, happy birthday, Ethan. <laughs> Fantastic. Definitely deserves a treat. Uh, we've also got something as a church to celebrate. We've got another new staff member joining us, and that's Tracy Hilg. Tracy is going to take on our mainly music uh, position that was vacant when Vicky had went back to full-time teaching. Uh, Tracy is already a permanent worshipping, part of a permanent worshipping community elsewhere, so you won't be seeing her here on a Sunday um, unless their church isn't operating. But she has had 20 years of running mainly music, and so we're really, really blessed to have her join the team. We're really looking forward to that. But as you're going past, do you want to stop off and give a chocolate to Val, or if she's still there, Val? has been leading the mainly music. She's over your left shoulder, unless she's hiding. Um, Val has been fronting our mainly music, took on the role of doing all those wonderful songs where you've got to get down the ground, then leap up again and be floppy clowns and all sorts of things, and has done it very, very well. So we're very grateful for Val's uh, contribution to mainly music. And she'll still be there, but won't be quite such much the front person. Thanks, Val. Things coming up, um, a reminder about confirmation conversations, I already mentioned that in my sermon, but that starts this Wednesday at 7 o'clock in our gathering area. Please pray for those people as they journey with uh, Kerry and work, and work towards confirmation. Uh, the rest of the notice is there's a lot of things here in our news areas. I do read there's lots of things coming up, but a lot of it I know is to do with our garage sale. For those that haven't been here during a garage sale, it is a major event in our calendar. And so tomorrow between four and six, the bunker down those stairs is almost filled to the ceiling in places of donated items. And so we have to take it from there up into our hall and, and disperse it around the church ready for our sale next Saturday. So we will have a van, we will have a trailer, and then it's just also people carrying boxes. So if you're able to give even half an hour, it'd be great if you could be the told two hours, but help us out as we distribute it and get it up to where it's going to um, be sold. That would be amazing. That's tomorrow from four to six. Helper and security training, we've already had two sessions of that. One was on Saturday morning, one was at nine o'clock this morning. If you've missed that and you're running a stall, uh, Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, in the gathering area, uh, Liz and John Glennie will run another session. Friday night, pre-sale event, drinks and nibbles as part of that. Everybody, uh, it's $5 to enter, and we hope to obviously sell some of our larger, um, more expensive items, so spread the word. It's a great way. We make a lot of money from our Friday night sale, um, and it's a great social evening as well, so that's over here in our gathering area. My suggestion is, if you've got any questions about the gathering sa um, sale, garage sale, Liz, I can see you down the back. There she is waving. She was here last week. She'd love to talk to you if you've got some time or if you think, can you do with a help during the week? Yeah, the answer will be yes, and she will tell you what you could do or, or what you can be involved in. There is cake boxes there also by the table ready to be picked up. Now, after all of that, 
There will also be Father's Day treats for the male members of our congregation, because I know there were some sad-looking puppy faces on Mother's Day uh, during the year. So we've got some chocolates ready to distribute for them. Today is the cupcake competition. And, you know, we didn't actually get any messages for our Patronal Festival, but we did get a message wishing us well for our Bake Off. I wonder who that would come from. Would that be Glenn Ashworth in Blenheim? I got this text. I hear it's your Bake Off tomorrow. I hope it goes well. Send everyone my best wishes and um, let me know who wins. So um, for those who don't know, Glenn was a previous vicar here and would always enter in, in good fun. And some people have been saying, so who are the judges? I have searched high and low, and I've got the perfect judges this year. We didn't need to bring in any people from overseas. We didn't need to go to the council to get councillors vying for their positions on council. I have got, you know, we all know teenagers eat everybody out of house and home, and we all know males do it better than anybody else. So representing that younger age member in our congregation who is already in the hospitality business, so comes with expertise, our first judge is Cameron. Yay, Cameron. And now our second judge is also from the other end of the maturity scale, someone who has got years and 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 years of baking. I found out just by chance that this year they're not entering the competition, and every other year they do, but this year they're not. And so the other judge is, from the females, is Shirley Bevins is going to be our other judge. Yay, Shirley. So, so that they're not going to get bribed as they begin their judging, I'm going to let the two of them begin to make their way out now and get themselves sorted out, and that will take place. We've got little, little certificates for people for the winning. Cameron, you might want to escort Shirley out. We'll come and see you shortly, and it might be sort of... And, of course, once the judging is done, you can buy these delectable treats for a gold coin. We've got an FPOS machine there, a paper bag to take it away, buy something for lunch or morning tea. That will do. That will do, Louise. Stop talking. Our final hymn, Will You Come and Follow Me, as we're talking about the call of God, and are we prepared to take up that cost? This is how we're going to conclude our service. Thank you for all who have contributed. Let's stand. <laughs> 